have people come in. Okay, good afternoon and welcome. My name is Evan Wiener and uh, we're going to go to Quebec City today. Um, hopefully some other people will come in. Quebec City, do you remember the front neck and, uh, and uh, City Hall? That's Quebec City. Quebec City is where, you can make an argument, America starts. Uh, I remember, that's the slogan of the uh, province of Quebec, uh, Montcalm dies in the plains of Abraham. And uh, about, uh, oh, I would say 28, 29 years ago, I was in Quebec City, I was a reporter covering hockey, and the National Hockey League draft was uh, in Quebec, and I'm in front of uh, uh, the Chateau, uh, Chateau Frontenac, and my son was about seven, eight years old at the time, and he was a little upset about some stuff, and uh, I knew a hockey player by the name of Anders Hedberg, who played with the New York Rangers, and he came over to me and he says, what's up with your son? Why is he upset? And I said, um, I'm not sure. He says, can I talk to him? And I said, uh, sure. So we walk out of the Chateau Frontenac onto uh, what looked like a big, big field. And he says to my son, he says, take a look at this place. Just look around. He had played with Winnipeg and they used to go to Quebec about nine times a year. Take a look at this place. This is where North American history changed. This is where the English defeated the French. And this is where America may have started. Uh, Montcalm was the, uh, or keep it Montcalm, was the uh, French general who lost Quebec City. The English gained Quebec City during the Seven Years' War, that's in 1759. The British, under the command of General James Wolfe, besieged Quebec City for about three months. And they were able to uh, take to the city. Now, you're looking down from uh, the top of the cliffs uh, by the upper city. Quebec City is a lower city, and it's an upper city. And uh, you're looking down at the St. Lawrence Seaway now, which used to be the St. Lawrence River. And the French thought that Quebec City was pretty well protected because there were ramparts all around. Um, and, um, and you can see that from today that there are these walls. But the walls kind of end. They kind of end around here. And it's a cliff. And the French figured there's just no way the English are going to climb up the cliff and we're going to be able to, they're not going to be able to get us. We're going to be up here. But the English did climb up the cliff and they got onto the plains of Abraham. The city was defeated. The French general, uh, Marcom, uh, Marquis de Montcalm, was killed. A very short battle uh, took place, 15 minutes. After Montcalm is killed and he defended the city, the British claims the victory, or the British claim victory, and there's a surrender of Quebec. And that is part of the Canada's problem today, going back to uh, 1759, because the French became a minority uh, in Canada. Uh, and there's, there's the Plains of Abraham, and that is where uh, Anders Hedberg, the hockey player, took my son out there and started looking around and started showing him the big field and also uh, the river, uh, which was 200 feet down below. Uh, the British and French had coexisted in North America, but they were warring in Europe. And um, there were certain things that the British weren't too happy about, uh, about the French. Because, and it all had to do with money, in this case, furs. Uh, the threat of French expansion into the Ohio Valley, where now it's uh, Ohio, uh, caused the British to attempt to eradicate New France from the map completely. Now, uh, the Plains of Abraham, the city, Quebec City, permanently lost by the French. 1763, France formally ceded its claims to uh, the Canada and Quebec City. French-speaking Catholic population came under the rule of the British uh, Protestants. Britain goes home. War is done. And for the first time in a half century, they don't have to fight any wars. They, their best troops leave North America, or the Northern Territories, the British North American Territories. And in the south, south of, uh, of New Brunswick, uh, Nova Scotia, uh, the southern colonists are saying, hey, wait a minute, what's 
going on, and do we really want to be part of Britain? Jacques Cartier was the French explorer. He was the one who claimed Quebec for, uh, and part of Canada for France. There's an awful lot of history that has taken place in Quebec City. A lot that Americans don't learn about. The Walled City has, had a, has a unique European feel. French and English are both the official languages of Canada. Quebec City is the capital of the province of Quebec, uh, Canada, and it is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, settlement in North America. And there's the Walled City. They built the wall thinking that they'd keep the English out. Prior to the arrival of the French, the location that would become Quebec City was the home of Native, uh, well, First Nations, Native Americans in uh, the United States, First Nations in Canada, and it was the home of an Iroquois village called Stekkana. Cartier was the first European explorer to go up the St. Lawrence Gulf, now the Seaway, and he claimed Lake Canada for France. Samuel D. Champlain. Champlain, Lake Champlain is in between Vermont and New York, the big lake up there near Plattsburgh and Burlington, uh, Burlington rather, and uh, that's a big statue of uh, Champlain uh, in Quebec City. Uh, in 1608, it was chosen as the site for a permanent trading post, and why not? It was on the river. Uh, 1608, Champlain was the guy who did that, and the name oh, Quebec okay. comes from a uh, First Nations word, uh, 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 where the river narrows. That is Quebec, where the river narrows. The year 1608 marked the beginning of a continual French presence in the area. And there's another picture of uh, the St. Lawrence Seaway uh, from on top of the cliffs. Uh, in the 17th and 18th centuries, several historic battles uh, were fought among the French, British, Americans, and Native peoples. Rusted cannonballs are still around, and they can be seen lodged in trees and buildings in the old city, the old city which is down here by the river, and the, old city, the newer city is on top. It remains the only walled city in the US or Canada. Quebec is the only walled city. Uh, the word uh, Quebec, a gambling word, where the river narrows. Champlain and his crew built a wooden fort, which they called the Lehabitation, uh, within a few days of their arrival. Uh, and these are the two guys. There's, uh, this is the parliament building, or the, uh, where uh, the politicians in Quebec City meet. And uh, over here is James Wolfe, over here is Hong Kong. They will forever be linked in history because Wolfe won the battle in Quebec City, and this is uh, statues uh, to both of them. Quebec City's maritime position and the presence of cliffs overlooking uh, the St. Lawrence River made it an important location for economic exchange between the Indians and the French. As in other locations throughout New France, and New France was Quebec, and New France was also, or maybe not uh, called New France, was Acadia, which was Nova Scotia, which is presently today Nova Scotia, along with uh, New Brunswick and uh, Prince Edward Island and a piece of Maine, Acadia National Park uh, is in Maine. Um, as in locations throughout New France, uh, the population could be split into the, the colonial elites the clergy, government officials, craftsmen, artisans, and uh, the Hong Jones um, uh, were there. Uh, the city contained about 30 homes in 1650, 100 by 1663 for a population of about 500. When the French returned to Quebec in 1632, they constructed the city based on the framework of traditional, of traditional French mill. Uh, in which the 17th century city was a reflection of its society. Quebec remains an outpost well into the 1650s. Oh, I eat there. That is the oldest restaurant in Quebec City, well, actually Canadian. Uh, they have some good food there. And every time I'm in Quebec City, I eat there. It's the oldest restaurant in Quebec City. And it's still pretty good, and it's not really pricey good place. Population continued to increase with the city having about 1,300 inhabitants by 1681. 
the city uh, quickly experienced overcrowding, especially in the lower town, which is right against the river, uh, which contained two thirds of the population by 1700. The numbers became more evenly distributed by 1744, with the lower town housing only about a third of the population in the upper town housing containing almost half of the inhabitants. By the 18th century, Quebec also saw a rise in the number of rental dwellings uh, to help accommodate a mobile population of seamen, sailors, and merchants by the time of the British occupation by 1756. Quebec, uh, or rather New France, had involved uh, to a colony of 60,000 with Quebec as the principal city. All the fights over Quebec. Since day one, 1620, a construction of a wooden fort called Fort uh, St. Louis started under the orders of uh, Champlain, completed in 1626. 1629, the Kirk brothers, under English uh, order, took control of Quebec City. They held the town for three years until 1632, when the French took over again. Louis XIV, there's a statue of uh, Louis XIV and me uh, down in the lower village, or the lower part of Quebec City. In 1662, to save the colony from frequent Iroquois attacks during the Beaver Wars, the fur. Louis XIV dispatched 100 regulars to the colony. Three years later, 1665, the Lieutenant General de Tracy arrived in Quebec City with four companies of regular troops before long troop strength risen to 1300. 1690, Admiral Phillips, Anglo-American invasion, uh, Anglo-American invasion, uh, failed to capture Quebec City during the King William Wars. A lot of wars over in Nova Scotia that uh, went, ended up in Quebec. Under heavy French artillery fire, the English fleet was considerably damaged, and an open battle never took place. Uh, Quebec City, having used most of their ammunition, the British became discouraged and retreated. 1691, General Louis de Bas de Frontenac constructed the Royal Battery. 1751, during the Queen Anne War, again, these are all these wars that were fought in Nova Scotia, which was called Acadia then. Uh, Queen Anne's War, the Admiral Walker's fleet also failed in its attempt to besiege Quebec City, in this case because of a naval uh, accident. Uh, Walker's initial report said that 884 soldiers died. The number was reduced to 740 eventually. Quebec City, I remember, I remember. That's the slogan. I guess I remember prior to 1759. Uh, it's a unique society. The British were having problems with the Americans, obviously. The Massachusetts colony, Boston in particular. Um, King George III said the colonies were in rebellion, and the English were having a lot of problems in Boston. And they began to realize that, hey, you know what? What's going on south of Nova Scotia? What's going on south of Quebec? You know what? It may come north. In fact, there were people in Nova Scotia who said, hey, wait a minute. Why aren't we joining the southern colonies? Why are we still here? Why, you know, why is there colonialism? In Quebec, it was more of a problem. The English had practiced uh, ethnic cleansing in uh, Acadia, New, uh, Nova Scotia. And most of the French-speaking people were gone by 1765. They just cleaned them all out. Some of them ended up uh, in Louisiana, which is why America has Cajun culture. But uh, the British are beginning to look at uh, the uh, southern colonists, soon to be Americans, as trouble. And they begin to realize that we better do something to shore up the British northern colonies, and particularly in Quebec. Because in Quebec, they said, you can't practice your language, you can't practice your religion, you just can't do it. But they began to worry about the Southern colonists. So the Quebec Act was passed in 1774. And that allowed the Canadian, the Quebecois, to have uh, religious and linguistic freedoms. You could go to church, you could speak English. And you could openly practice Catholicism and use the French language in Quebec. 
And it wasn't like the English said, hey, let's do this because, you know, you're good people. No, 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 no. They had a reason. They wanted to make sure the Quebecois stayed on their side in what they thought was an upcoming war against the southern colonists. The Canadian, therefore, were not too unhappy enough with British rule to choose to participate in the American Revolution. Without Canadian cooperation against the British, the 13 colonies instead attempted to invade Canada uh, and Quebec. It wasn't Canada in those days. It was, uh, it was British North America. Uh, Benedict Arnold. This is an interesting story. George Washington could have had Nova Scotia to himself. He was there for the taking. And in those days, if you looked at the map, Nova Scotia was just a river apart from Massachusetts. That was it. That's currently Maine and currently New Brunswick. But back in those days, Nova Scotia was right there. And uh, Washington could have basically sent a bunch of guys in because there were plenty of rebels in uh, Nova Scotia and taken it. Nova Scotia could have been the 14th colony. But Benedict Arnold, Benedict Arnold was talking to George Washington. And he said, why would you want Nova Scotia? You can take Quebec, and you can conquer Quebec. And Benedict Arnold leads the Continental Army into Quebec, and guess what? He lost. The city was, uh, again, under siege, the Battle of Quebec in 1775. The southern colonists, soon to be Americans, initial attack was a failure due to American inexperience, and the Americans didn't believe it got that cold in Quebec. Now, you were, when were you in Quebec last? 60 years ago? Were you there when it was cold? Because it gets real cold in Quebec. Really, really cold in Quebec in December, and the Americans or the Southern colonists weren't used to it. Benedict Arnold refused to accept the defeat in the Battle of Quebec, and the siege against the city continued until May 6th, 1776, when the American army finally retreated. America did not get Nova Scotia, nor did they get Quebec. Nova Scotia was there for the taking. Washington decided ultimately it wasn't worth the cost of ammunition to take Nova Scotia. So is Benedict Arnold a hero? Was he a traitor? Well, Nova Scotia is about uh, 700 miles away. Quebec City is 550 miles away from New York. Nova Scotia is about 700. In fact, Nova, Quebec is closer to uh, uh, New York than, say, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, or Nashville. Um, Halifax in Nova Scotia is closer to New York than, say, Chicago. So I guess it depends where you are. Uh, is Benedict Arnold the hero? Well, that is St. John's, New Brunswick. And this guy here in the statue is Benedict Arnold. Uh, after the war, the loyalists, George III loyalists, had to flee. They had to go somewhere. And the British Crown decided, let's send them to Nova Scotia. And we'll cut Nova Scotia in half, and Nova Scotia will become New Brunswick. And, uh, but is Benedict Arnold a hero or a traitor? On 1785, Benedict Arnold and his son Richard moved to St. John, New Brunswick, where all the uh, loyalists ended up. Not all of them, but a good many loyalists ended up. Where they speculated in land, they became real estate uh, barons and established a business doing trade with the West Indies, or people with the West Indies. Uh, Benedict Arnold would uh, purchase large tracts of land and acquired city lots in St. John's and uh, Fredericton, New Brunswick. Uh, but the family was forced out. Uh, they got to go to London because uh, Benedict Arnold and his family, business men, his family, uh, was disliked because of bad business deals and petty lawsuits. I guess once a traitor, always a traitor. Uh, by 1791, Quebec was quote unquote settled. The Constitutional Act of 1791 divided Canada into Upper, the English-speaking colony, and Lower, the French-speaking colony. Quebec City was made the capital of Lower Canada and enjoyed more self-rule following the passage of this act. The city began to grow in the uh, 1800s, the early 19th century. It was the third largest port city in North America. The port cities back in those days were 
Halifax, Quebec City, uh, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Charlotte, uh, Charleston, South Carolina. The business boom continued for most of the uh, 19th century, and Quebec City started to welcome in thousands of immigrants. But there were rebellions. See, about 50 years after the Americans or the Southern colonists decided they had enough of uh, King George, actually 60 years, enough of King George III, there were people in the British uh, Northern Territories who had enough of the English, wanted to get rid of the English. Well, the rebellions were that, but it was also something else. It was also something that still impacts Quebec City to this day. During the rebellions of 1837 and 1838 in Upper and Lower Canada, Upper Canada being Quebec, hundreds of armed citizens rose up against the government protesting the injustices of the ruling elite and demanding changes in the politics and economics of uh, imperial rule in British North America, which is now Canada for the most part. The revolt in Lower Canada was more serious and violent than the re uh, rebellion in Upper Canada. In 1839, the Brits wanted to get to the bottom of this, and they wanted to find out what was going on. This is, you gotta remember, this is 63 years after the Americans left, and they're getting antsy in the North. They want to leave. Uh, in 1838, the British politician Lord Durham was sent to British North America to investigate the causes of the rebellions of 1837 and 1838 in the colonies of Upper and Lower Canada. Durham's report on the affairs of British North America led to a series of reforms and changes. These included uniting the two Canadas into a single colony called the Province of Canada in 1841 but did more than just that. Bur uh, Durham proposed the creation of municipal governments in the Supreme Court in the British North American colonies. He wanted to resolve the Lang uh, question in Prince Edward Island. Is it a colony or is it part of Nova Scotia? Uh, his long held plan for the union of all British North American colonies was dropped because Nova Scotia and New Brunswick was uninterested. But something else happened. Something else major happened. Again, let's go back to well, Wolf on the left, Montcalm on the right, 1759, 80 years earlier. Durham believed the problems in the mostly French Lower Canada were ethnic in nature, not political. He found two nations, the French and the English, warring in the bosom of a single state. And Durham was culturally biased against French Canadians. Uh, he called them a people with no literature, no history, even though there was a history, and they did have literature. He recommended assimilating them by uniting the Canadas in a way that would allow the English-speaking majority in Upper Canada to dominate. The Durham Report was condemned by Upper Canada's Tory elite. Reformers in Upper Canada and Nova Scotia had the idea of responsible government. That's what they wanted. The French, second-class citizens again. Uh, we need a capital. By 1857, the English want to have a capital in their colony. And the province of Quebec uh, was in need of a permanent seat of the government. And it was basically Ontario, Quebec, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island uh, at that point. For 15 years, the government had moved from one place to another, Kingston, Ontario, a thousand islands right across the border uh, of New York, 1841, Montreal, 1844, Toronto, 1849, Quebec City, 1855. Well, what were the problems with those capitals? Quebec, Kingston, way too close to the United States, just over the river. Uh, and you could invade, so that was out of the question. It's also was named Kingston, after the king. Americans might get upset at that. In the 1850s, somebody thought it was a good idea for Upper and Lower Canada to have a capital. And Quebec City, Montreal, and Kingston, Ontario, were in the running. Montreal, way too French. Can't have it there, too French. Quebec City, 
way too French. On New Year's Eve, 1857, Queen Victoria, a symbolic and political gesture, was pre presented with the responsibility of selecting a location for the permanent capital of the province of Canada. She didn't do it, but they said she did it, but that wasn't her job. It was the Prime Minister, John A. Macdonald, that was assigned the selection process to the executive branch of government. Its previous attempts to arrive at a consensus ended in a deadlock. So they got this town filled with prostitutes and drunks uh, called Bytown. Comes to Ottawa. And they say, hey, that's a good place because Toronto is kind of at the outer end of, uh, of Canada at that point. Uh, and Quebec City is here. And Ottawa is halfway between Quebec City and Toronto. Ottawa is right on the border of Quebec. Next town over was uh, Hull, which uh, has been renamed Gatineau. And if you want to have a good time, you go over to Gatineau. You don't stay in Ottawa because they roll up the sidewalks at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Go across the, over to Quebec and you have a good time in Gatineau, which used to be called Hull, but they changed it because it's in Quebec to Gatineau. Anyway, that's Parliament. If you notice, Parliament is on a hill, Parliament Net Hill in Ontario. The Queen's Choice turned out to be a small frontier town of Ottawa for two reasons. Ottawa's isolated location in the backcountry, surrounded by a dense forest, far from the American border, and situated on a cliff, which would make it more defensible from attack. Except, uh, it was malaria. And the malaria between the United States border, that forest, that swampland in Ottawa, made it perfect because the Canadians or the British didn't think the Americans would invade Ottawa from the south because that forest was filled with swamps and malaria. And they didn't think that the Americans would sacrifice people to malaria. Today, the forest is pretty much gone take uh, Route 16 or Canada 16 right from uh, Ogden, no it's not Ogden's town, uh, Ogden's town, Burke, Ogden's Burke. Uh, it's another city there. Ogden Burke is by Cornwall. And uh, anyway, take it right up there, get on 16 and right in Ottawa. Uh, and there's uh, Parliament. Ottawa was uh, midway between uh, Kingston and Toronto and Canada's west and Montreal and Quebec and Canada's east. Nova Scotia at this point is pretty much on its own. By 1848, they get independence. The others are controlled by Great Britain, so Ottawa is the perfect capital. Uh, Charles Dickens went to Quebec City. He was impressed with Quebec City, really impressed with Quebec City. Uh, he was not Scrooge-like in his praise. The impression uh, made upon this, the visitor by uh, this Gibraltar of America, it's Guinea Heights. It's Cibidal suspended as if it was in air. Uh, it's picturesque, 50 streets, flowing gateways, and splendid views which burst upon the aisle at every turn uh, is at once unique and lasting. Charles Dickens, America's Notes, 1842. Uh, that falls actually bigger than Niagara Falls. Montemur, uh, that is the Montmorency uh, Falls. And you can take the bus from downtown Quebec City right to the falls. You can be right next to the falls, or you can see the falls if you're on a ship, which I've been in, in Quebec City's harbor. Uh, it's 30 meters or 98 feet higher than Niagara Falls. Uh, the falls were a site of a key scene between the lead actors in the 1947 <laughs> film called uh, Whispering City, which was filmed on location. And that's the Chateau Frontenac, probably the most famous building in Quebec City. Uh, it's an iconic symbol for over a century. It's on top of the headland. The Chateau Frontenac has stood overlooking the St. Lawrence River and uh, Dufferin Terrace for more than 100 years. Construction on the most photographed hotel in the world. That is the most photographed hotel in the entire world. Uh, began in 1892. 
Since then, it's been expanded several times, including in 1924 when a central turret was added, and again in 1926 when a fire destroyed a part of the building. Uh, place where I am, Petit uh, Champlain, old church uh, in the lower part of the city. Uh, the little square with a lot of history. Uh, legendary place royale steeped in history. It's here where Samuel de Champlain chose to erect his uh, habitation, which served as a fort, storehouse, trading post, and residence when he got there in 1608. It was the first French settlement in North America. Place royale is also the home to Notre Dame de Victories, uh, the oldest stone church in North America built in 1688. And another picture of uh, the St. Lawrence Seaway. The old port offers stunning views, loads of laid back charm. It's a promenade with a view as far as an eye can see on the St. Lawrence River, or by foot, or bike. And uh, it's 30 miles from uh, Quebec City bridges to the falls. Again, you can take a bus there, and it's only like four bucks to take the bus. Uh, oh, that's me and my friend Rusty, Rusty Blake. Look at uh, the walled city right there. Get uh, from the uh, upper city to the lower city going through that passageway. Uh, Rue Saint John, that's the passageway, features a string of boutiques, restaurants, churches, historic buildings, a uh, fountain in front of the government center. It's called the Fountain de Tournay. Fountain de Tournay stands directly in front of the Parliament building with 43 water jets. Uh, it's sculptured features. Uh, it is a seven meter high uh, fountain, which is lit up at night. And there is Parliament Hill in Quebec City. The motto, I remember. I remember what? In 1883, Eugene, uh, Eugene Etienne Tarche, Assistant Commissioner for Crown Lands in Quebec, an architect of the Provincial Parliament Building, had the motto carved into stone below the coat of arms in Quebec, which appears uh, above the uh, Parliament main entrance door. The motto came into official use, even though the coat of arms was not adopted until 1939. All around Parliament, there are 24 statues of historic figures uh, who was given a special place uh, for he was seen as an important uh, player Obtaining responsible government. Taché purposely left blank space open to allow future generations to add their own statues. World War II. World War II, Quebec City was a spot where Franklin Roosevelt met with Winston Churchill. And there's a bust of Churchill, there's me, and on the other side of the street, there's uh, Roosevelt. The first Quebec conference was held in August. 1943, Franklin Roosevelt, President of the United States, Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, William Lyon Mackenzie King, the Prime Minister of Canada, and T.V. Song, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of China, plans for the forthcoming Allied invasion of Italy and France were discussed in Quebec City. And there are the world leaders. Again, you can see in the background uh, the uh, front net, and uh, there's Churchill, and uh, there is Roosevelt, and um, they were meeting there on the Plains of Abraham. That bench is still there. It's still there. Uh, the second Quebec conference was held September 1944, attended by Churchill and Roosevelt. The decision was made there to advance against Germany on two western fronts. Additionally, there was a revised timetable to invade the Philippines resulting in the Battle of uh, Lute Gulf in October 1944 and the struggle for Okinawa, spring 1945. There was the World's Fair, Expo 67 Montreal, uh, the 100th anniversary of Canada becoming a country. Canada became a country on July 1st, 1867. Uh, in uh, Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island, and oddly enough, Prince Edward Island did not join the Confederation. Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Quebec, and Ontario. But they had a big World's Fair, Expo 67, come one, come all, to Expo 67, uh, Montreal. The World's Fair held in Montreal from April 27th to uh, October 29th, 1967. It was considered the most successful World's Fair of the 20th century. Um, 
But something happened. International incident involving the French president, Charles de Gaulle. Canada started in Prince Edward Island in this building, which was undergoing renovation the last time I was up in Prince Edward Island. De Gaulle. De Gaulle is in Montreal, and he sees this crowd in front of him. And the crowd in front of him is waiting for him to speak. And it sets off an international oh, incident. Yeah. Yes, uh, long live free Quebec, right? 1967. And it goes back to 1759, goes back to uh, the report uh, back uh, in uh, 1840, right? Uh, the Durham report. On July 24th, 1967, the French President Charles de Gaulle, stood on the balcony of Montreal City Hall and shouted, Viva le uh, Quebec Libre to a crowd. De Gaulle gave an international voice to Quebec's burgeoning sovereignist movement and caused a diplomatic incident. Prime Minister Lester B. Pearson criticized the speech, saying De Gaulle's statements were unacceptable to the Canadian people. Well, that was one of the shots fired in uh, the road to separatism in a country. Uh, the language. The language would become French only in Quebec. In fact, there's only one province uh, in uh, Canada where the official languages are both English and French. That's New Brunswick. Official language in Quebec is, is French, uh, although in federal buildings, and that was a federal building where that stop sign was taken uh, in Quebec City, they have a right to stop. Since 1763, the Quebec Quad had been ruled by the British, and then the Canadians, and there was a problem to some. Uh, the thought by some is Quebec should be independent by virtue of uh, New France having been conquered by Britain in 1763 and subsequently relinquished to the British in exchange for Guadalupe. It argues that the people of Quebec are descendants of conquered people who are due their national sovereignty. Now, was a hockey game the beginning of the modern separatist movement. Now you might say, a hockey game? How could that be? Well, Rocket Richard. Rocket Richard gets into a fight with Hal Lego, a game between Montreal and Quebec. In the 1950s and the 1960s, European countries were giving up their colonies in the name of independence in Africa, in the Middle East, in South Asia. By the 1950s, Canada, uh, while remaining under the crown, was pretty much an independent country since, say, 1931. But the start of the Quebec separatist movement might have been in 1955 with that guy right in the middle there, Maurice Rocket Richard, who I did interview about that uh, in the 1990s. It's March 13th. Montreal Canadiens are playing in Boston. And uh, Hal Lenko was a defenseman with Boston. High sticks, Rocket Richard. Richard skates over the Lego and hits him in the face and shoulders with his stick. Richard continued to go after Lego and was trained by the linesman, Cliff Thompson. Richard broke loose, punched Thompson twice in the face, knocking him out. The NHL commissioner, uh, Clarence Campbell, who was a judge in Nuremberg, National Hockey League uh, president, Came down hard on Richard, suspended him for the rest of the season and the playoffs, and that did not sit well with people in Montreal. It's a smoke bomb during a Montreal Canadian Detroit Red Wings game in Montreal. They were so upset, somebody released a smoke bomb in the arena. That's March 17th, St. Patrick's Day. The Canadians return home to play Detroit. First place show them. NHL offices were in Montreal. Campbell attended the game, even though politicians told him, don't go, stay away. Detroit got off to a lead, and midway through the first period, uh, Campbell was pelted by eggs, vegetables, and garbage. Uh, Rocket Richard, Richard goes insane. Uh, again, started in a separatist movement, a tear bat, uh, gas bomb was detonated. The Montreal Forum is evacuated. Uh, Detroit's given a forfeit victory, which was really secondary to the problem at hand. There's a riot on St. Catherine Street, Rue de St. Catherine's. There's a riot taking place there uh, after Richard is uh, suspended, after the smoke bomb, and all that other stuff. Uh, I asked Rocket Richard, did you start the separatist movement? 
I no, I didn't. But outside the forum, there's a riot. And this startles the rocket, who really didn't know how well liked he was in the province. Richard is seen as a hero by the French Canadians. The suspension sparked a movement, according to some, because the Quebecois, Rocket Richard, stood up to an Englishman, Campbell, with the riot. But Rocket Richard never saw it that way. But that is uh, St. Catherine Street after the riot. See, a lot of damage was done. Riot occurred along a seven block uh, length of Rue St. Catherine's, overturning cars, smashing windows. A shot's fired from somewhere. 137 people are arrested. And he has to go on the radio. And he does go on the radio. And basically begs for peace. And said, hey, it's only a hockey game, except for what it is. And he begs for peace, pleading for the cop. Uh, I talked to him short about it. He said, I was surprised to see that. I had to go on radio, ask the people who were doing all the damage on the streets of the store to stop. Lasted only one night. But he's a hero. Viva Richard. Campbell, well, you know, don't go. Viva Richard. It's been suggested that the separatist movement began in Montreal because of a hockey game. Although to this day, scholars actually argue over it. Richard's role, what was Richard's role? He's just a hockey player. And the people decided, we've had enough. We don't like what's happening. We're going to rise. It's one fact that this certain. Maurice Rocket Richard was suspended. And there was a riot on the streets of Montreal. Some scholars insist that was the first time Canadian, French Canadians rebelled at English Canadian authority because of a perceived slight. The Rocket was on eight Stanley Cup winning teams. First player to score 500 goals, probably the most popular and best known person in Quebec in the 1940s and 50s, and that popularity became major problem in 1955. A guy named uh, René Levesque uh, took up the cause, uh, and he was the leader of the uh, uh, protest movement, separatist movement in Quebec. Separatist movement was uh, dropped by the party for most of the 1980s, especially after the uh, uh, patriation of the Canadian Constitution uh, without the consent of the party Quebecois government and the creation of Federal Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which enshrined the protection of the French language and French culture in Canada. Uh, there were referendums that first occurred in 1980 when uh, Quebecois uh, wished to uh, open constitutional negotiations with the federal government and other province, provinces for the intended purpose of establishing a sovereign association pact between the province of Quebec and Canada. Approximately 60% of Quebec voters uh, rejected the idea put forth by the Parti Québécois leader, René Lebec. And there is the uh, French flag. In 1995, after two failed attempts by the Prime Minister Brian Mulroney's government to secure a Québécois ratification of amendments to the Constitution, the Parti Québécois held the second refer the referendum. The question was whether one wished for the independence of the province of Quebec from the rest of Canada. The response was in the negative, this time a far closer margin. 50.58% said no, 49.42% said yes. So it was a 1.16 percentage point difference. And there are the massive stone walls around uh, Quebec. And uh, this is the cliff over here. This is the British climb the cliff down there to get to there, which is uh, where the plane today were at, was. Quebec City is the birthplace of French North America, only walled city north of Mexico. It's the birthplace of both the northern and eastern part of modern Quebec City has a big role in history, a huge role in history. Except here in America, we don't really learn about it. And it's only 550 miles from New York City. Thank you so much. Any questions? You're in Quebec City. Any questions, comments about it? This was the history of Quebec City.
Thank you. When were you in Quebec?